Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Success Life Live. My name is Eric Reed. I am so glad you are here and tuned in and watching us. Um, it's Fun Friend Friday, my favorite day of the week. Good morning, Kevin. I'll be bringing you into the room in just a minute. So go ahead and, you know, finish the hair and the makeup and all the other things that we do before we jump on to an event like this. Everybody, I want to welcome you into today's Fun Friend Friday. Good morning, David Peterson. Good to have you in the house. Yes, I know. I owe you a replay or a uh, tag and a coffee. Good morning, Craig. Good to have you again. Congratulations on making top 10 on the John Maxwell stage um, last week. I know that was a big accomplishment. And a, 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 it was a stepping stone, a big stepping stone. Yeah, I'm finishing my hair. You go with that, Greg. So a couple things coming up as we log in and sign in. Um, remember that next week on Wednesday evening, we're having an author talk. Um, this is the author edition or the final proof edition of Wendy Burns' book, um, Remarkable You. And it's been a lot of fun reading it and getting ready for it. So you, um, it's a journey of, as she puts, uh, hope to discover unshackling, revealing, and enabling you to become the remarkable you. Fabulous book. Fabulous book. Go over, check out her uh, pre-order site. Again, Remarkable You, Wendy Burns. Um, and then about mid-September, we will be having... Oh, that's not very useful to you guys, is it? Um, Liz Akar back on with her second book. Still working out the title details. But So those two author talks will be coming up. Um, in the month and then um, next week's fun friend Friday if you've been struggling with how to make social media happen for you like you know you're supposed to be on social media but it seems like this big mall of America too many things too many options too much stuff to venture through then you're gonna want to be here for fun friend Friday with my friend Phil an expert good morning miss M or good afternoon Renee um, good morning, Sylvia. Uh, man, everybody just piling in. Take a minute, hit the share, hit the like, hit the community button. Make sure all your friends, family, neighbors, countrymen, and those people you have influence tune in because I promise you, I promise you, this is going to be big. Kevin is going to be big. Um, as you can tell from the description above, Kevin has quite a history, quite a bio. Um, there's a lot going on in Kevin's world, and I really appreciate him being here as our Fun Friend Friday guest. So often in this dialogue of abuse and trauma um, and sexual abuse, a male voice is missing, and that's both culturally um, as well as genderly. That it's, it's a voice that needs to be heard. It's a voice that's been silenced too long by cultural um, norms. And so I'm so grateful that Kevin chose to break his silence and not in just breaking his silence, but he has gone like big time sharing his message, getting it out there, exposing the truth, and so that kids can begin to recover and adult kids in recovery. So I'm gonna pop Kevin into the room so Kevin, if your hair and makeup isn't finished, you're just in trouble. So aside from all those, Kevin is big. I, I, there he is. Da, 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 good morning. Like, <laughs> yes, sir. You are good morning. How you? Yes, sir. How you doing? I'm excited about this conversation. Yes, sir. I am. I gotta tell you, this week digging in and finding all the little bits and watching your videos. Thank uh -huh. you, sir. Oh, appreciate that. That's, that's, that means a lot to me. I'm so grateful to have a platform to share my story and to share what's so important to me and the rest of the world uh, as it relates to trauma and abuse and how it's affecting our future. And so, you know, my whole goal is to make tomorrow better for today's children. So to, to give them a world, have them incorporate uh, their passions and not just accept the world that we've created for them, but them to get involved in creating the world that they want. And you're, and you know, I love people of action, but you are bold exactly. action. You've written yeah. Understanding Child Abuse Investigations for Mommy and Daddy. So if your child mm -hmm. is in the middle of an investigative period, nobody ever tells yeah. the parents, this is what's going to go on. This is normal. Nope. 
yes, you, the husband, will be investigated. You, the mom, will yeah. be investigated. Yeah. Don't take it personally. And yeah. so I love that idea that it's, and it's done in the dummies for you format. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. often in the middle of that trauma, the parents are trying to not only manage it emotionally as parents yeah. and then as individuals, but also logistically and legally. Mm -hmm. They have to be oh, in yeah. so many roles. Yeah, and a lot of times what happens, as law enforcement officer, I was a law enforcement officer for 20 years and an, an investigator for 12 years. What was happening was most investigators were finding that parents were getting frustrated with the process. Well, the reason they were getting frustrated is because we never took the time to explain to them the process. Oftentimes, we would take their child, take them to a back room, interview them, and then bring them back out and say, okay, we'll call you in a couple of weeks to let you know next steps. Well, that's kind of frustrating for a parent who feel like they don't have the power to help their child in this most devastating time. And so a lot of times what happens is this, this, this disconnect between law enforcement and families happens because law enforcement uh, doesn't understand that when a, when a child is abused, it's not just the child, it's the whole family is disrupted. And so if we don't educate the parents, because a lot of times what happens is we, we would arrest the, sub, the suspect, remove the suspect out of the home, but then we'll take the child and put them right back in the same environment which the abuse occurred. Not understanding that the brain actually associates the environment as well as the act together. So we re-traumatize the child even by putting them back in the same environment. So we don't educate the parents on how to change the environment to be conducive to healing. Then what happens is the child has a less likely chance of being healed fully from the trauma that was enacted by the abuse. Yeah, um, an example I offer, and I've worked with foster families, foster parents. Mm -hmm. If it had an F in front of it in Gwinnett County, I've been yeah. dealing with it forever. And I would uh -huh. say to you, glass ice hitting a glass is a cool mm -hmm. drink. To a child yeah. that's survived trauma, that's the first step in mommy or daddy yeah. having drink, and then mommy and daddy yeah. having two, and then three, and then me getting beaten, mm -hmm. and then nobody there yeah. in the morning to take me to school. And they can mm -hmm. see the pattern that is triggered by just that sound of the ice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because the brain never was meant to forget. The brain was brain remembers based on survival. So the brain remembers triggers, whereas something may look, you know, ordinary to us, to a child or a person who's been traumatized, it could trigger an event and cause them to actually uh, feel something that is, is no longer present in their lives. That's why we get post-traumatic stress disorder, right? The brain associates a trigger with the event, even if the threat is no longer there. And as a result of that, the person is, the person is not even conscious of why they react in the way they act reacting they just react and so we judge the behavior why not without understanding the person and the trauma associated with the behavior so we end up judging people rather than listening to them and I, this is one message that i heard over and over again as i've listened to other tv interviews that you've been on and podcasts mm -hmm. and your mm -hmm. your your speech is we judge the behavior mm -hmm. And we address the behavior modification, behavior correction, we institutionalize yeah. based on the behavior and yeah. never ask what was the origin or what is the echo that yeah. is creating this behavior. Yeah, yeah. And I often tell people that I is a, is a great judge, but it's a horrible listener. Right. Ooh, you have to listen with you. Yeah. That. That's yeah, quotable. Yeah. Somebody today. Yeah. The yeah. I is, that, a great... is a great. It's a great judge, but it's a horrible listener. You cannot listen with your eyes. You need your heart to do that. And so oftentimes what I teach detectives and people who deal with them, become curious because becoming curious allows you to have compassion. And once you get compassion, it allows you to connect with the individual and it's through connection that you're able to communicate. So it all starts with a curiosity as to why is this person responding to this the way they're responding to it. You know, and a lot of times we judge people. And right now, currently what I tell people we have a system right now that only responds to abuse. The system that we have right now in place responds to abuse. It doesn't seek out to prevent or to um, uh, deal with abuse victims. So we, we, we incarcerate, but we put the victim in a situation where they have to deal with the trauma. I often tell people... Okay, here's the thing. You can't arrest trauma. You have to deal with it. You have to confront it. 
and you have to educate people about it. And so a lot of times we have a system, if you think about it, if you really think about it, we hold victims accountable and responsible to stop their own abuse because until they say something, the abuse continues, particularly when it comes to children. And so we have a system. We hold yeah. the victim responsible. We hold the victim mm -hmm. responsible for preventing their, their own abuse. abuse. Yeah, yeah. Because if you think about it, you know, we have. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we, get, we yeah. have to laugh. That's a bit ridiculous, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah. Because sure we question. And then, and then goes yeah. back to that old saying of, "Well, she asked for it. Did you see what she was wearing?" Yeah. So we question the victim, but we give the suspect the benefit of the doubt, right? So the victim has to be, the, the 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 abuse victim is the only victim that has to prove that they're a victim, right? The assault victim, the gunshot victim, that has to prove that they're. Uh, a victim of assault, the gunshot wound enough is is is, a, is proof enough, right? The burglary victim doesn't have to prove that their house was broken into. The alarm, the missing merchandise, the kicked-in door is the proof. Uh, a car theft victim doesn't have to prove that they're a victim of auto theft because the missing vehicle is the proof enough. But when it comes to abuse victims, when they make the allegation, we say, "Can you prove it?" And then we question them repeatedly. And if there's any inconsistencies in what they tell us, we automatically assume that they're lying, but we don't understand how trauma fragments the brain and causes the memory process to be interrupted because the certain uh, neurotransmitters and uh, the chemicals like cortisol disrupts the hippocampus, the part of the brain that helps us remember, right? And so this whole ideal about fight, flight, freeze, we actually had it backwards, right? So, because most people say, why did they fight them off? Why didn't they run? Where the natural inclination is when you traumatize is to freeze. It's a survival response. If I walk up behind you and startle you, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take a deep breath. You're going to freeze without you even being, you know, knowledgeable that you froze. And another thing that you got to remember is that part of the brain uh, that, that deals with freezing is the Broca's area where you speak. So people ask, why don't you scream? So I had cases where children were molested in the rooms where there were, there were, there were parents and there were uh, siblings in the other room. And one of the things people used to ask, you know, the jurors used to be, why didn't they scream? Well, the first thing that is taken away during trauma, during a traumatic experience, is the person's ability to talk, to speak. And so what happens is we live in a culture that we keep re-traumatizing victims so they remain silent because the moment they say something, they get questioned, they get challenged, they, they're not believed. So, so let me rewind. Lord, I'm mm -hmm. going to be studying you even further. <laughs> so... So often we approach we when I say we the general population the un mm -hmm. the uneducated and I put myself right dead center at the top of the curve yeah. for that okay got you. is 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 we forget that there is a biochemical process that's happening mm -hmm. during that trauma we just assume yeah. it's a physical he touched me she oh, yeah. touched me they grabbed me. Yeah. And we're like, well, why didn't you respond with equal physical force? Force. Yeah, because cause what happens is in a traumatized state, we freeze. And we flee if we can, and we fight if we must. Right? That's the, that's the so real order. So we freeze, we flee, we fight. Yeah, we don't fight, flee, freeze. We freeze automatic, which is instinctually, which is impulsive, which is a survival uh, uh, response. And then if we can find a way out, we'll run. And then if we can't find ourselves not able to run, we're trapped, then we fight our way out of it. Well, think about so, it when it comes to child so, abuse. So as so so I'm sort of like sitting in the room as mm -hmm. the victim or mm -hmm. um, the person who had just experienced trauma. In mm -hmm. that moment when it occurred, my brain, my body, my survival mechanism, the, the biochemical wiring said, shut down everything except vital organs. Curl yep. up in a ball, guard yourself. Because Play dead. It, we need to maintain the heartbeat, like all things yeah. breathe and heartbeat. So screaming would be a waste of that vital organs. Like, you, like there is like what? an actual like, if you scream, it will put us in further danger. Shut up. Exactly. And uh, in, in addition to that, the part of the brain that your voice comes from is shut down. The left hemisphere of the broken Because area. the brain is it's, saying preserve energy, preserve yeah. fuel, preserve because the, blood. Yeah. Get the limbic system, the most basic human yeah. function zones only. Yeah, 
And actually what happens is your brain is hijacked by the survival system, the limbic system, the amygdala, that your alarm system is hijacked. So that part of the brain takes over, like you said, it controls your breathing, it prepares your muscles, right? And so it, it, tell, it directs blood in areas that are vital to survival. So what happens is it takes away from those areas the social brain, because you, now you're dealing with the social brain. When I'm trying to survive, I don't have time to be sociable. So the parts of the brain that is used for social interaction is taken away from me because it's needed for the survival so part of me. So is that, I'm just going to be like banging you with questions. <laughs> no, so is okay. that why often when abuse victims try and recant the situation, height, color, gender, oh, clothing, man, that's the all wrong of those questions. elements are missing because yeah. those are social, yeah. we learn those through social interaction. And yeah. so the brain isn't registering that as vital information in the moment. It's not because now what you're asking me, you ask me who, what, when, where, why questions, which is the cognitive part of the brain, which is part of the social brain. And that's part of the brain is not readily available to me because I'm still in a traumatized state. In fact, most law enforcement officers recreate the traumatized situation. So that, for was, instance. that was going to be my yeah. question next is, yeah. so in the event, so I'm trying mm -hmm. to dig this out. So stick gotcha. with me because I said I'm at the top of the pyramid of the dumb <laughs> gotcha. man. Uh, so in the event, my brain uh -huh. says no cognitive function is necessary. Do not even think about it. Like, mm -hmm. we've got to do what we got to do to stay alive. Um, yes. And then when I come into the police station, so to speak, and mm -hmm. I realize the situations are all different, just as, and I come mm -hmm. in and you say, tell me what happened. I'm like, I don't know. Immediately, yeah. I'm assumed as not legitimate, like the crime didn't yeah. occur. Like I'm just calling, like all of the, the doubt yeah. of my story rises to the top. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then as you begin to pressure me, my brain yeah. says, uh-oh, here we go again. We're about to yeah. get attacked. Shut everything down. Shut everything down. And not only that, as police officers and law enforcement, we're trying to arrest suspects, not to cater to victims. So what happens is we use victims to get to our suspect. And victims, because of the state of mind that they're in, because they're already sensitive to, to their environment because they have been assaulted and they've been traumatized, they pick up on everything. So victims are more intuitive to know when, when a person really doesn't care about what happened to them. I'm more concerned about you giving me information than I am about how you were affected by what happened to you. So, for instance, if I go to the hospital and a victim, I get called out to the hospital as a detective and a victim is laying in the bed, right? She's laying in the hospital bed. As a detective, I come in, I got a gun on my side. I got a badge around my neck. In my mind, the victim should see that I'm a detective. I'm a safe person to talk to. However, in her brain, it, the, the traumatic situation has just been recreated because most of the time when victims are assaulted, they're laying down, right? And then most of the times, the assailant is standing over them. So I just recreated that traumatizing situation to the brain. So the brain is shutting down the social part and the trying to remember part because now I just put that victim in the same situation that they were in when they were attacked. Because you got to remember the brain not only remembers the act, it remembers the situation around the act. And so here I am with this gun that I have every day as a police officer that I'm accustomed to, but it may be the victim's first time ever seeing a gun, or it may be the same weapon that was used upon them during the assault. So the part I'm asking them to remember, because you got to remember trust and memory go hand in hand. If I can't trust that I'm safe, then me remembering is going to be more difficult. And most police departments think just because victims walk in front of, walk into a police station or the police is present, they feel safe. In fact, in some instances, the victim may not feel, may feel even more, even less safe. Because now, again, like you said, they got to remember the information or that, that happened to them. And if I don't remember correctly, could it be possible that this person won't believe me? And here's and then, another thing I tell you. Know? And then we layer on the idea that many victims are victims by proximity. Yeah. Uncles, aunts, cousins, brothers, yeah. dads, school teachers, mm -hmm. football coaches. And so yeah. if I step out of my community and yeah. declare this event occurred and I can't be convincing enough, not only do yeah. I have to go back into that community, but now I go back into that community somewhat unprotected you, with yeah. a police officer following me in and pointing a yeah. figure at the people. Yeah, and judge, and, and not only that, this is what I tell people, healing is a disruptive act. It's a revolutionary act. So when, it, when the victims come forward, they're not just asking for justice, they're asking for restorative justice. Help me not only to stop the abuse, but help me heal from it. 
So most of the time, the police departments just go in to stop the abuse, but we don't set up a restorative practice where we can help the victims heal from abuse. Now, there are other agencies that can come in and do that, but most police departments do not set the victim up for success. They're just more concerned about the prosecution of the case. So, so Kev, I, dude, you are brilliant. You are brilliant. So that's probably why you have over five books on Amazon on the side. Yes, sir. So, and on my side of the page, everybody is just like, it's a, a nausea expression, gobsmacked. They're just like, this is too mm -hmm. much information. So I love that. Mm -hmm. By the way, I've got to drop the plugs. Well, the 12 Project, if you want to know book, get involved with Kevin on this level, go to the 12 Project. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that. You can find mm -hmm. it everywhere on social media. But here's what I think is interesting. When you said the word, it's not just justice, because we think that victims come forward because they want that punishment. Like, I yeah. want yeah. you oh, to yeah. punish him. Oh when yeah. In fact, what you're saying is it's really about restorative Dorn. justice. Like I need yeah. to get back to a place that had before oh, yeah. it happened. Like oh, yeah. if somebody breaks into my house and my TV is missing, justice is served by the police department and restorative yeah. justice is somewhat served by the insurance, insurance company. company. Yeah. Whereas yeah. So, if I come yeah. into a police station and I admit mm -hmm. being um, traumatized or being in the middle of trauma or abuse, you can't always follow through on the, on the justice justice because of mm -hmm. the, the nature of the crime and all of the little details, or you have mm -hmm. to spend so much time focusing on achieving that justice. There's yeah. this gap of like, okay, where's my insurance check, so to speak? Like, where's the yeah. person that's going to help me make right? Because the person I told isn't helping me and now I have to go tell somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. Yeah. I have to keep going back through and reliving that trauma until mm -hmm. somebody somewhere begins to help me create a restorative justice process for myself. Yes. yes. And that's the purpose of child advocacy centers. I love child advocacy centers because they start the restorative justice process by uh, providing therapy services providing, uh, you know, families with, you know, uh, ways that they can talk about their, uh, their things that happens as a result. Because you'll find out in a lot of abuse cases that a lot of abuse is transgenerational, right? It just doesn't happen to the child. It's been happening in the family for years. And so what happens is we deal with symptoms and not root causes, right? So what we're dealing with today is symptoms. Like human trafficking is a symptom of abuse, right? opioid crisis is a symptom of abuse. And so what happens is we're seeing what happened in our, what's happening in our world today is a result of the abuse that we ignored on yesterday. So abuse, the word itself, the root word use, is where we get utility from, utility, purpose, and power. AB is the prefix, right? AB means to kill, steal, or to destroy something. So abuse or abuse means to kill, steal, or to destroy someone's purpose, power, or potential. So if you're going to do just Somebody write that one down. One more time, and I'm going to make you do yeah. it slow. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, okay. as so, simple people, us <laughs> simple people need little things we can hook on. You <laughs> Got know, you. We, we ain't as studied as you, mister. No, no I, I'm just, you know, I, I understand. I am, you know. I am loving this. I am absolutely <laughs> Oh, like thank you. Like my bookshelf is going to have a few of yours out there. So <laughs> I appreciate good. that. I appreciate that. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's when we think about abuse, and a lot of times I go to abuse conferences, I ask somebody to give me the definition, and it gets quiet. And I said, well, I am at an abuse conference to learn more about abuse, and they laugh, and I said, but that's seriously the, 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 the definition of abuse. You know, the root word is use, right? Where we get the word utility from, and utility has to deal with our power, purpose, and potential. And AB is a prefix, means to kill, steal, or to destroy something. And we know Anytime you put a prefix in front of a root word, it changes the meaning of the root word. So abuse or abuse, as we pronounce it, means to kill, steal, and to destroy someone's purpose, power, or potential. Now, when I do this for churches, I said that sounds a lot like John 10.10, 10, where the enemy comes to kill. To justice, we respond to the abuse but we do not come in and we do not restore the person back to that full potential before the abuse happened. And as a result of that, that person lives through that traumatizing situation every day of their lives. And until there's an interruption so, for somebody to I, come I, in. I, I love this idea. Um, mm -hmm. I serve as a prison of Emily. Oh, anyhow, I, I'll get to you. I, sorry, Helen. Just great. <laughs> 
you get, Helen's going to connect with you, I promise. <laughs> Renee is already connected okay. with you. Um, I okay. love this idea of abuse, that we take away somebody's purpose um, from them. And so often when you talk about general generational abuse, it was like, well, I learned to manage it. I learned to cope with it. I got over it. You do the same. Yeah. And it's yeah. not like I return to my purpose. I did. I return to my goals. I return to my potential. It's yeah. like I learned to walk with a short leg. You need to yeah. too. I survived, and, and and I don't thrive. I, I I've learned how to cope with 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 what I was dealt with instead of overcoming what I was dealt with and returning back to my authentic self so that I can live the life. Because here's what I believe. I believe that that everything that we need is in the earth inside of a human. If you think about it, nothing comes into the world, you know, without a human being. And so what if the cure for cancer, Alzheimer's dementia, is trapped inside an abuse victim waiting to be reconnected back to that person? So the only way we're going to get those cures is through healing people. And so uh, what happens is, is if I abuse someone, I take away the ability to connect to themselves, and that's for they have difficulty connecting with others. So that's the one thing that abuse does is it fragments the brain it disconnects the person from themselves. It deals with shame, guilt. So the person sees the world as a very disturbing and dangerous place. So whatever I have inside of me, the world would not be able to experience because I have withdrawn from the world. And this gift, this calling, this potential, this purpose that's, that's buried deep inside of me, the world would never find out its full, full ability because I have been abused. So... And I know this kind of goes way to the left, but because you are a detective uh -huh. in your history, it would be an interesting mm -hmm. perspective. Is that why, and I'm going to sound jaded and I'm going to sound devil's advocate, but you guys understand mm -hmm. that that is part of the conversation. If we don't discuss it, mm -hmm. we don't get enlightened by it. Is yeah. that why there is sort of this sudden movement in the Me Too that people are coming up 30 or 40 or 50 years later saying Me Too? And there's this idea like, really, come on, it's been 50 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is because that a lot the of idea that they've been so disconnected for so long. Yeah, it's that's part of it, and also the part of it is that we live in a culture that punishes victims. I mean, just we 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 punish victims when they come forward and think about it. The courage to come forward and say something like that happened. I, I often use an example. If you know, when I'm in my workshops, I tell people if anybody wants to volunteer and come up here and tell me about their last consensual sexual experience and tell us about every detail. Would you be willing to do it? And people look at me like, no way. And I said, yeah, yeah. But Excuse yeah, me, I'm going and, over here. yeah, 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 yeah. And I tell you, you know, but this is what we ask victims to do. We ask victims to tell complete strength. And here's the interesting part about it when it comes to law enforcement. I tell them most of the times when victims are telling law enforcement their stories, law enforcement is looking down writing. They don't even have to come in decency to look the victim in the eye as they're telling them the most horrific story that's ever happened to them in their lives. That means a lot to a victim. To be to be heard because being heard leads to being healed, and if I'm writing being, and, and being heard leads to being healed, you guys get that one yes. down. Yes, <laughs> yes, because Miriam Miriam Greenspan, I love the quote she says. She, she says that without a concerned listener, the healing process is aborted. Right? Without, without someone, a and that's concerned listener, the healing listen, process, yep, process is, is aborted. aborted. So, and yeah. I want to like unpack that real quick. Um, mm -hmm. It's aborted, meaning the person began to want to move into healing. Mm -hmm. And as soon yeah. as they realized the person across from them wasn't a concerned listener, they aborted the healing process. Like, and not like only, yeah. abort, pull the, pull the yeah. safety lever. It's not safe, back. yeah. And not only that, think about it in the larger uh, uh, aspect of things. The culture becomes, because you cannot heal outside of community. You can't heal alone. Right. It takes a community, a culture to be able to enable you to heal from the injury that has been caused upon you. And so we live in a culture that says, get over it. We live in a culture that says, prove it. We live in a culture that says, hey, we got to get a suspect the benefit of the doubt, because unless you can you can cause for a detective, I have to prove I have to convince 12 people that it happened to the victim for the defense attorney. They only have to convince one pe person that it did happen or they don't even have to convince them. They just have to prove. Uh, put in a, 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 a sense of doubt in one person and that one person can come back and come back with a not guilty plea. And so if it took a person 10 years to finally come forward and then you got to remember, this is not a, a, a simple process. You know, this victim has to go talk to a detective. 
Uh, this victim has to talk to a, a district attorney. This this person has to talk to investigators. This person has to reveal things to their families that their family probably didn't know. And it's probably against a, against a beloved one in the family that everyone respected. So now this person, healing is a destructive act because when I want healing, see, victims just don't want an arrest, maybe. Victims want to be healed uh, from what happened to them. And our culture right now currently is not set up to, 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 to provide victims with the proper healing that they need because our culture questions victims rather than listen to them. And what I, so a couple of things. One, everybody needs to be hitting the watch party, the share party, the connect to my community party because <laughs> trust me, I'm going to be like watching this five times over. <laughs> um, so do that. I mean, and if you don't want to do it now, great. Come back, grab the video, put it up on yours later, and explain why it made an impact. Second, that idea of the Me Too movement um, mm -hmm. and the idea that 20 or 30 years later somebody comes forward and begins the discussion, I imagine that the first level detective, not being disrespectful mm -hmm. to them, is like, it's been 30 years. What do you want us to do? Yeah, and, and because they don't understand the nature of abuse and how it's, how it's robbed this person of their vitality and how much courage it took to say something. It took me 30 years. Uh, and here I was, and people don't understand this, I was a police officer at the time. I had a loaded gun every single day, and I was going home. People often ask me, what was your most fearful moment as a police officer? It was when I got home, looked in the mirror, and I saw the guy staring back at me. And there were times that I would hide my service weapon from myself because at night when I laid down, because I used to sleep with it on my, on, my, on my dresser, I used to have thoughts of suicide. And oftentimes I'll be tempted to reach for that gun. And so I used to go to bed and put my, my gun in the closet in the hopes by the time I walked from my bed to my closet that I would think about my family and those that I would hurt before I made that, so, made so that decision. You, so here we have, so... If we're thinking that it's about gaining control, gaining empowerment, feeling safe will be the healing process. We have somebody that by all definitions in society is like the biggest, baddest, meanest looking thing on the planet. He's got a badge, he's yeah. got a gun. He, <laughs> yeah. he, can, he can get in his cop car and call up 20 mm -hmm. people. He's going to bed at night frightened mm -hmm. by his community and the trauma that he experienced is still hunting you down. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And using alcohol to cope, you know, dealing with addictions. And then, you know, when I learned about ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, and understood that, you know, that this trauma was causing illnesses to my body because I was holding all this negative energy in and didn't have a way to let, have an outlet to share it. And so my body began to respond. Uh, I love uh, Bessel van der Kors book, The Body Keeps Score. You know, because the body is a communicator of the spirit. So if my spirit is uneased, then my body becomes diseased. And so as a result of that, uh, a pre-diabetic, uh, overweight, uh, eating habits, you know, uh, decisions. Oh, man, dude, the decisions you make, very impulsive. So your finances, your, 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 your relationships suffer. That, that you, you can't be an authentic, intimate relationship because intimacy deals with trust and connection. And the last thing I want you to do is connect with the real me, the hurt me, the little boy me. I want you to connect with the person that I feel is, 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 is lovable. And for that, that's not the real me. So you know? I want to I sort of shift a little um, mm -hmm. out of respect for time, but also because I'm just selfish and I want to make it about me. <laughs> um, gotcha. <laughs> let's talk about men. Okay. Because... <clears throat> I am sure when you started to feel like you could unpack your story, it was like, mm -hmm. what kind of wimp were you? Yeah. Were you? I bet yeah. you enjoyed it. Were you gay? Come on. Yeah. You had yeah. To yeah. Like all yeah. of the things that we do in the locker room mentality of manhood. Oh, yeah. Like, come on. You could have kicked him here. You could have done that. You liked it. Yeah. And, and yeah. I will speak also because of your ethnic background, there's a, mm -hmm. like, a oh, yeah. another layer on top of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and then, go ahead. go ahead. Now, but then when I tell people, you know, you got to remember I was a 12 year old little boy when that happened, and it was an adult male who attacked me um, and tried to kill me and left me for dead. Um, and so the miracle, and it's, I tell people, it, I don't think it's, a, it's ironic that I live in a city now in Atlanta. I'm in Fort Lauderdale right now, but I live in Atlanta, where a city where uh, many young men, young boys met a different fate than me. You know, with you, the Wayne Williams thing. 
You live in Lawrenceville, just so you know. I used to live yeah. in Central High School. Okay, cool. Okay, all right. And, and yeah. As I was reading your story, I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> back over there by the Boys and Girls Club. Um, yeah. But anyhow, and yes, Atlanta was a hotbed of civil rights movements where young men mm -hmm. were persecuted, where among, young men were hunted down um, just because of yeah. the color of their skin and the racial tension that occurred, and still somewhat in Atlanta, some in some pockets. Mm -hmm. Um, so you had that layer to work yeah. into, but as a 30, at 30 years later, when you start to tell the story now as a full grown mm -hmm. man, having mm -hmm. to, people didn't, when you tell the story now, people didn't see the 12 year old boy. They saw the person standing in front no. of them. Yeah. And that's, that's a great point you make up, Eric, because a lot of times jurors, uh, they don't see the victim. They see the person sitting in front of them. And so if that person comes with a suit, they're not crying because, you know, we have a particular uh, view what a victim should look like, what they should respond, how they should respond. If I don't remember, what do you mean you don't remember, <laughs> you know? And so uh, they don't understand the impact of trauma. And so part of my goal is not just to train professionals who do the work, but go into the communities and train communities on how to recognize trauma and the effects of trauma, long-term trauma. So what happens is, particularly when, when you look at me as a male, you look at me as a full grown man and say, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> you know, what do you mean you didn't, that happened to you? And you're talking about it, but you're not ashamed to talk about it. You know, and like I remind people, um, you know, I play football in the same stadium that my abuse occurred for the next four years of my life. Not once did I think about it. And that's part of the disassociative. That's part of how the brain copes with the trauma. As a little boy, you try to forget about it. You try to put it out of your head. And all my life, I hid, right? If you look at my life, I went into playing football, which is a uniform. I went into the military, a uniform, became a police officer, which is a uniform. And so I tried to hide behind the uniform so you can see the uniform and not me. And so that's what happens. And a lot of times, some victims work their way out. Some victims use drugs. Some victims use violence. Some victims use sex. And so a lot of times we judge the behavior, whereas we don't actually sit there and listen to why is this person or this individual, particularly when it comes to men, because this whole sexual orientation thing comes up, you know, uh, does that make you, you know, uh, homosexual, you know? And so, and, and what's so ironic though, is when I go speak around the world, it never fails. A male will come up to me and say, you just told my story with tears in their eyes. And to be the first time they ever told anybody is when they told me. So by me standing up telling my story, it's almost like I gave them the freedom to come out. And some of these persons are police officers. So you know, I, I never forget. the title for your next book, Stepping Out of uh -huh. the Uniform and Into Me. Oh, yeah, I like that. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Y'all heard it right here. So if I use it, <laughs> Eric gave me permission. Stepping out of the uniform and into me. Because I really see that yeah. as the journey when you were willing to step out of that uniform, that mm -hmm. mask that we all wear, and say that this uniform, even now, doesn't protect me from who I really am. Mm -mm. No, nope. I've got to start stepping into me. And so, and I don't want this to become a, a therapy or counseling session because mm -hmm. it can't be. It just can't. Yeah. And I'm aware of yeah. the reality. But what does that beginning stepping out of the uniform and into you look like? And then we'll it's, get it down on paper and I'll become your okay. editor. Yeah. All those <laughs> it's, it's scary uh, because you have to deal with, with conversations when you're around people like, you know, they're lying and, and you're sitting there like, no, you know, without even revealing what happened to you, to your coworkers, you, you, but they see something different in you. Like I saw six serial rape cases and five child murder cases, and it had, all had to do with me understanding victims. It had nothing to do really with my, my greatness and my expertise. It's just that victims would tell me little things that they thought wasn't significant, but because I was listening, they would bring up the little, and it is always those little things that solved the case. So victims solved their cases. And not only that, it, it went back to empowering my victims to take control of their story. You know, I would tell victims, you know, you don't have to talk right now. When you feel like you're comfortable and feel like you want to talk, you know, call. And that contradicted what most law enforcement also was trained. Get it now, get it now, no matter what it takes. Get the information, get the information. And we don't take the victim in consideration. But by me being a victim myself, it allowed me to, to and I didn't know this, but it, when I started studying trauma and, and I finally started telling my story, 
that connection was there without me even being, you know, aware of it because I had been a victim myself. In fact, one of the reasons I did come forth is because I saw a little boy tell his story and I saw how bold he was and I saw how courageous he was. And it seemed like a resurrection happened right in front of me. So as he told his story, the more emboldened he became, the more alive he became during the interview. And I watched that little boy walk into an interview room with his shoulders down, head down. I watched him walk out skipping with his shoulders back, head up. And that he just wanted to be heard. Right? That's all he wanted. He wanted somebody who could believe him and hear his story and listen to him and care about him more than what happened to him. And so that, that, was, that was a revelation for me. So, and we, we um, I think it was Renee and you and I last night, we were like, we need to come mm. up with a, a symposium with at least the two yeah. of you. I can think of 10 other people. Yeah. What was it Smashing the Silence or Silent No yeah. More? Um, yeah. A workshop to find your voice. But yeah. so I want to go back to though, that idea that when you started to tell your story and you heard the mm -hmm. people say, oh, come on, look, you're a grown man, mm -hmm. you got a house, you got yeah. a car, you got everything you need, mm -hmm. let me go. Yeah. Or yeah. really, I don't see how somebody could take advantage of you. You got like all of that doubt yeah. that people cast, I think is one, because it's an uncomfortable topic. Like you said, no yeah. one's going to talk about yeah. what they did last Saturday mm -hmm. night. Yeah, yeah. Consensual, let yeah, alone yeah. non-consensual. Yeah. So it's an uncomfortable Puritan mindset. Mm -hmm. As I look at the city of Atlanta, and you and I can mm -hmm. share that connection, they have mm -hmm. special special units, specially trained officers, special mm -hmm. people that are that probably come in without the uniform and the badge and the gun, and they know how yeah. to slow down the process. What yes. about those people outside the city of Atlanta? When we think of kids yeah. are not children of sexual abuse or of abuse or of trauma, don't all live in highly trained, specialized communities no. where they can pick up the phone and get somebody like you to walk in the door and manage the case. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point you make because that's one of my biggest, biggest pushes now. We don't have the infrastructure to deal with the amount of cases that are coming forward. So a lot of times detectives are overwhelmed by the amount of cases that they're getting. And so as a result of that, see, people are watching. There are victims watching on television, you know, uh, how we respond to victims, how, you know, social media, you know, sometimes social media can be cruel, you know, how people question, like, why did you tell, like, you know, people defend perpetrators, like, or are, because of their status, because of their fame, they'll say there's no possible way they could have done that because of who they are, but you have so many victims coming forward and saying, this happened to me. And so other people, kids are watching that, you know, kids are watching when we give an Oscar to a song that says it's hard out here for a pimp. Right. So so we, we're, we're celebrating abuse. And at the same time, we, we okay. say we want to we, deal we with need, it. We need to. I, I, I can't be quiet. We yeah. have spent and I'm not making a political statement, but the last two mm -hmm. plus three years, well, four years celebrating mm -hmm. abuse. Oh, yeah. And abusers oh, yeah. And making tabloid headlines out of the victims. Oh, yeah. You know, she, oh, yeah. she was a pole dancer. She won. It's mm -hmm. like, wait a minute. Just because you're no. And we have made how yeah. how disempowering uh, or reaffirming of the abuse is it when we celebrate songs and artists and celebrities oh, yeah. and politicians oh, yeah. and not hold them accountable, but actually be like, oh, it could never happen. I mean, they're the yeah. CFO of you know yeah. X Y Z. Yeah. And, and, and they, and, we, and then we, we wonder why it takes thirty years for somebody to raise their hand and go, "Me too." We do not live in a victim-friendly culture. I mean, we've never have, and so, so uh, you know, you have politicians. I remember listening to the to. Um, uh, I think Clarence Thomas, you know, <laughs> the judge, Supreme Court justice saying, we need to get out of this victim mentality. And you have a Supreme Court justice saying this, and it's like, wow, you know, and so. It's, it's, it's one of those things, and I tell people all the time, you know, not to get religious or spiritual, but Jesus was a healer and an educator. And, and that's, that's disruptive. When you start healing people, you, and, and part of healing people is educating them on the effects of trauma, not just understanding that, okay, because you can't lock trauma up. You can't lock up trauma. You, can't, you can arrest an abuse, abuser, but you can't arrest abuse and effects of trauma. And so you have to confront it and deal with it. And so a lot of times I tell people, you know, we deal with human trafficking and sending news a lot. Human trafficking has been going on. I mean, you know, I'm from a city in Memphis 
when pimping was celebrated. You know, as little kids, I remember, you know, we see guys in the Cadillacs and Fair Coats, you know, we admire them, you know, because in the community they were looked up to, you know. So, so now all of a sudden, you know, we, we, we fast forward and now it's coming to the point where all this energy and all this, this lack of attention that we forgot about in the past is now affecting our present. And now we're, we're not built. We don't have the infrastructure to deal with it because we have never looked at abuse the way uh, we should have been looking at it for years. So, I'm, again, thank you. Thank you. And if anybody hasn't shared you're this, welcome. you're not my friend. Uh, that's a joke. <laughs> because I am like, I am just like, gosh, I am. I feel so ignorant. Just like, I feel no, so no, no. ignorant. <laughs> so I honor and thank you for whatever brought us into the space that you are educating me. And I always say that's really what Fun yes. Friend Friday is. I get like these free yeah. seminars. So thank yes, you sir. for delivering it at like that level. <laughs> oh, no problem. I it's mean, a pleasure. Lord, it's a we pleasure. could be here until midnight tomorrow. Um, yeah. yeah. But I love that. And you guys, so again, go to the, um, the 12 Project. Look up Kevin. He does a variety of ways he shows up in your community, whether it's with police officers, whether it's helping families and children and advocacy. Mm -hmm. You can see that his breadth of knowledge and experience can be of service to any community, any school district, any faith-based group, any police station, mm -hmm. any anybody that knows that they're going to be in contact or have been in contact and feel that they're lacking. I mean, I only have to read one of your book titles. The other one is the talk about child abuse, Kevin, the invisible boy. I'm sorry, the, invis mm -hmm. the invisible little boy, mm -hmm. um, child abuse investigation workshop, workbook. And then there's Finding Kevin. Um, there's a, there's a new book. I, there's a new book coming out now in uh, October called God Child. That's actually a novel about human trafficking. I actually have a copy of it with, with me now. I can kind of hold Go up ahead. to let people see. Um, um, somebody has announced Kevin for president. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> and so I have um, Kevin the Invisible Little, little Boy. That's, that's, that's Kevin. Yeah. Kevin the Invisible Little Boy, and, and I have a pocket full of stones, which is a motivational book uh, to teach people how to use small things to make big changes in their life. You know, and that that coming that's coming from a victim perspective, because you know this didn't happen overnight. It took steps. It took me connecting with other people of like mind and and, and community, and and so um, that healing. Because, and if I can, I explain how that happens. You know, the brain, there's two hemispheres, the left and the right hemisphere, and they're, two, they're both connected by a band of tissue called the copious callosum, almost like a USB cable. And most neuroscientists would say that the right part of the brain is responsible for emotion, the left part of the brain is responsible for logic and, and, and contemplation. Well, the right brain can't talk and the left brain can't feel. And most of your trauma is trapped inside of your right brain. And so in order for it to come out, it has to have a way to talk it way out. So you have to have a community to be able to listen to that. And, but that has to have trust and safety. And so this is why cognitive behavior therapy works so much. Because if I'm able to talk about what happened to me, it gives me a greater chance of healing from what happened to me. But imagine holding that in. Right? And holding that in. Now the only option that I have is behavior. So... If, if I live in a culture that's questioning my behavior rather than asking, becoming curious as to why I respond the way that I do. And you see it now in culture. You know, we got shootings. We got, we got, but we respond. We got, we got the opioid crisis. Now we got this thing I saw on the news called the vaping crisis epidemic. We're calling everything an epidemic, but the epidemic, which is abuse. Right. So we're the, treating uh, symptoms. The, yeah. The things we're calling out epidemics are really just symptoms. Flags or markers yeah, yeah. of the abuse. Yeah. So I need to, I need to, like, I feel like I, I'm going to have assistant next time you're here. You're <laughs> oh, here's back. the book also before um, I forget. Uh, the, oh, yeah. Here's the, I'm sorry, here's the new book coming out. Kevin, Kevin oh, it's backwards. Oh, right, it's I Kevin McNeil, Godchild. Godchild. All right. Yeah. Um, so here's what I want you guys to do, and we'll get all the Kevin's links and everything, make sure it gets in. One of the things for me is I love that idea that one – one side feels, the other side thinks we need to figure a way of connecting them. But often what I've noticed in my working with families in crisis, working with kids in crisis, working in foster homes, 
the healing often starts very silently and very slowly. And so mm -hmm. having a book like The Invisible Kevin in your library, in your mm -hmm. reading room at your church, sitting at a table where a kid could accidentally stumble across it and turn a page mm -hmm. and be like, yeah. my name's not Kevin, but the rest of the story, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Having yeah. a book available in your parent support groups or in your wherever you meet that talks about the issue and the trauma. Yeah. Because there have been many times in my life I've like pulled a book off a shelf and sort of like, okay, I'm yeah. reading this, but <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to tell people about it because this is part of my healing process. Yeah. If you yes. are working your way through your own personal healing process and aren't ready yet to stand up and tell your story, and I understand that mm -hmm. path that it's going to require, dropping little seeds for other people to begin their story Oh, is yeah. part of healing your story. Oh, and so yeah. books like what Kevin does, mm -hmm. and just, you know, you never, I, when I say you never know, Kevin and I met, and I, I apologize, I have to go check my notes. I don't <laughs> remember if it was Jesse or Kip, but somebody said yeah, you Jesse. need to connect to this guy. I connected yeah. to mm -hmm. you. You were like, I don't have time for you. I'll get back to you next week. I was like, well, <laughs> no. kind of no. But it was totally cool. You were the cop. Right? Yeah, yeah. And then we kept yeah. pushing, and now he's yeah. here. Having yes. a book like Finding Kevin, um, your other book, I forgot. I'm sorry, my title brain is totally messed up. The <laughs> Invisible Little Boy, the talk yeah. about abuse, understanding child abuse, and then the workbook. Having one of those available yeah. for somebody else to just find and discover is like a $25 healing session that you're going to be a catalyst for. And then yeah. always connecting with the 12 Project which mm -hmm. in, um, go ahead and tell a little bit about the 12 project. Well, the 12 project for me was, is, 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 is the meaning is symbolic. Uh, I was assaulted when I was 12. Um, but it, it came to me when I was reading scripture, Matthew 10 and one, where Jesus, where the Bible says Jesus called the 12 disciples and he gave them power to heal abusive spirits. And for me, that was powerful. Like, wow, that, you know, the coming together to heal people from their, their trauma is what you know what what we're here for you know is 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 the greatest uh commitment i think that you can make to to society and culture um and so i decided to name it the 12 project 12 also is is it means restorative justice uh you got 12 days in a year i mean 12 months in a year you got 12 hours in a day you got 12 jurors that sit on the stand so it's it's, it's symbolic of justice of getting justice. Um, so there were 12 disciples. So I decided to call it the 12 project. And the goal of the 12 project is to raise $12 million in the next 12 years through the selling of my books, through the speaking around the country and the world so that I can donate that to uh, organizations that's already doing the work, that's already uh, educating, uh, educating people and providing healing services. I didn't want to reinvent the wheel, but if I can support those who are doing the work, that's what my passion is is to get this message out here, not just for professionals, but also to the general public so they can understand the effects of trauma. And, and thank you for doing that, uh, for sharing that part too. What I love about when I read into the 12 Project and the work that you're doing, you're like, look, mm -hmm. I am not gonna divert all the energy, all the momentum, all of mm -hmm. everything that's being done way over here because yeah. then we lose everything we've gained just because it's about yes. me and about my project yeah. and about my initiative. Mm -hmm. You said, no, yeah. I've been given this experience, this knowledge, this information. Show mm -hmm. me a way to bring it to you and then train, educate, develop, exactly. create within the momentum that you have this one little stream of awareness and then let yes. me go to do it again and again and again. And I love that because you're like, look, there are too many people, too many kids, too many adults suffer. It's still in that trauma that I don't have time to create the level yeah. of a momentum that 12 other organizations have. So let me just sort of yeah. push the pedal down a little bit further through what I do and what I can bring. Yep. That's exactly what I do. In, in, in my books, I write books with organizations in mind. Uh, like my new book, part of the funds will go to an organization to help build a house, uh, a, a ranch, and a piece of land for human trafficking victims. So when people buy God Child, they're actually donating into this effort to uh, restore victims back to their purpose and their power and their potential. So that's my whole goal. When I write books, I write with the mindset of how can I 
partner with an organization to give the proceeds, part of the proceeds, to help them do the work that they're doing to restore justice to victims. So people are not just buying a book when they buy a book from me. They're actually supporting a cause. So, I mean, Kevin for president. I'm just going to say that. Kevin for president. Um, <laughs> you guys, if you oh, live in a man. small town community, if you live in an area that doesn't necessarily have a special victims unit or an abuse victims unit, you could make a difference by just dropping off the book, Understanding Child Abuse Investigation for Mommies and Daddies. Mm -hmm. So that if there is a family yes. that walks mm -hmm. in and says, our daughter came home and this happens and we have no clue. The detective, the sergeant, whoever I'm, you know, would be like, hey, we're going to do what we can, but here's mm -hmm. a book we keep available as a resource for families like yours. Take it home. Yes. It does. Yes. And that's why I wrote the book. So they are. Yeah. Go ahead. Nope. I'm sorry. It doesn't. And, and to know that, to know what you're doing is you're helping bring cures and inventions into the world because these children or these people these women who have been who have been victimized and abused they still have purpose they still have power they will everyone is born with a purpose and so we're we're robbing ourselves if we're not restoring justice to victims who've been abused and we need to learn learn to become a listening culture rather than a judging culture and I, so I and also you know one of the things i push yeah and one of the things I push in legislation as well is hold people accountable that commit abuse offenses. Like, you know, if a person uh, commit, commits an abuse offense, they have to pay an additional 12% bond amount to even burn out of jail. And those additional monies go towards, you know, the healing of the victim and whatever county the victim was abused in. And also, you know, uh, we to get licenses. You know, if you can get licenses to start making people get trained on trauma as a result of getting licensed, you're going to get a marriage license. If you're going to get a driver's license, you have to be trained on, a, on the effects of trauma and abuse from a child advocacy center and have a certificate of completion and those monies that you use to pay for that completion go towards healing the victims. I mean, we do it for liquor licenses. Right? We do it for DUI classes. Right? But when it comes you, to victims you know, and our funny, children... Having been involved in, in foster care and foster parent, everything, I don't remember them requiring trauma education yes. they're not they're not required and, and you can open up a child care and you're not required you can open up an elderly uh uh home for elderly and you're not required and that i mean i don't want to laugh but it is that ridiculous stupidity laugh it's like okay so i'm bringing children into my home that are obviously mm -hmm. in the process of trauma because mm -hmm. that's why they're being removed from the home. And yet the, the, the receiver, the caregiver, the foster parent, et cetera, have no training in managing or even seeing trauma. You're good nope. with me. Yeah. And, and, the, and the thing is, the, the, I'm getting feedback. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, We're not hearing it, so it's just you. Oh, you're not? Okay. It's just me? Okay. Um, so, so what's happening is, is that a lot of people uh, don't understand that we're, we're, we're handing our kids off to people without doing the proper uh, diligence to make sure they're safe. So even in churches, right, there are people who are able to do youth ministries who don't have training on abuse, who don't have training on trauma. There are people who, um, you know, can, can open up uh, child care homes, foster homes that can hold up everything. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting feedback in my ear, so it's confusing me. But we have to become diligent and intentional to show that we're, we're caring about victims. We're not just responding to what happened to them. We care about how they heal. And so as a result of that, we have to make sure that we're being intentional because that speaks a lot to victims. Because victims, if, when they see that we care about what happens to them, then more victims will come forward and more victims will feel empowered. And then what you'll get is you'll probably get less abusive, offensive acts when people know that victims are not going to wait 10 and 12 and 30 years to tell because now they're educated, they can come forth immediately. And then we can start with the prevention process. You know, it's interesting because I'm thinking back to my experience from foster care. Um, so you have a child who 
two o'clock in the morning, gets removed from a home because of an abusive situation or something mm -hmm. along that line. They're picked up by a detective that says, we're going to figure out your case in the morning. We're going to take your mm -hmm. mom and dad and put them somewhere, take you, put them, put mm -hmm. you somewhere. So not only did they have the possible, the, the trauma event, but then the echoing of the trauma event by being displaced from their home, their community, their support network, and all of that dropped into a foster care situation, a, a care situation mm -hmm. into somebody who for the first time might be that first pebble of healing hasn't been trained on how to manage it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so the, the victim feels punished. The victim feels like they're being punished for telling. So I told, I did what I was supposed to do, and I was courageous enough to say, hey, this is happening to me by somebody who's supposed to be protecting me, and yet where the systems are set up is to come in and say, okay, we're going to take the child, or we're going to put the child in a different environment. In the system's mindset, we're helping the child, but we don't look at it from the victim's perspective. Like, is, how does the victim feel about it? So uh, we have to change that. And, the, and then the irony goes on further. So the child comes into the home. They don't feel safe. They don't feel listened. They don't feel connected to. So they blow up the placement to mm -hmm. go find the next person, hoping that that will be the person that listens, hoping that the next foster, next home, foster the next home, group home, the next, the next group. placement will be the place where they get to be safe again. And yet as yes. foster parents, detectives, caregivers, case managers, people in the system are like, this is a bad kid. They keep blowing up their placements. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, no, what yeah. they're doing is running around searching, list, hoping somebody will finally listen to them. Yeah, because their behavior is a form of communication. Their behavior is saying that I look well, but I'm not well. And so if we continue to judge the behavior, the child or the victim begins to say, okay, it confirms to me that the world is not safe. Where people say they care about me when they really don't care about me, they just want to help me cope with what has happened to me, but they really don't want to listen to how it's really affected me. So a lot of the times what happens in a traumatized mind is you don't feel worthy of anything. So for, for instance, my body was a burden to me. And you know, I tell people, can you imagine toting around something that you don't even like anymore for the rest of your life? It feels like a drag. Like what, 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 what you're celebrating is a burden to me. My body, I no longer look at it as having value. And the only way I see it as having value is through providing sexual gratification to other people because that's how I was introduced to sex, through force, right? To, to, through a point in life where my first sexual encounter or my virginity was broken by a man I didn't even know, right? And so I learned about sex through force. I learned about sex through... Um, you know, through, through someone introduce it to me through force, and then a man at that. So even in my life, I had a, a difficulty trusting male leadership because, and you got to remember too, my abuser looks like me. So every time I look in the mirror, I grew up to hate who I was because my perpetrator, my abuser looked just like me. And so you can't get any closer to you than you. And, and, and no, no matter where you go, there you are. That was so if you don't... <laughs> Yeah, so if you don't like you, you know, no matter how much people try to show love to you or try to help you, it may not be seen as help or love because you don't love yourself. And so restoring justice uh, to victims is helping them heal, helping them learn to not just uh, uh, give love but to receive love. And that's one of the most difficult things for an abuse victim who experienced trauma is to receive love. So I love the enlightenment as we bring this around because it's your vacation day. Um, <laughs> this idea that so often the outsider thinks mm -hmm. it's all about justice, legal justice, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, yeah. when mm -hmm. the, the abused um, individual is really about, I want to just get back to a place mm -hmm. like I felt before. Mm -hmm. And when I bring my story forward, when I bring, when I step out, I don't, it's not about justice, justice, though that mm -hmm. may be an element of it. Yeah. It's really about trying to figure a way back to where I was before this happened. Mm -hmm. And yes. I spent, so if it took me 30 years to understand that it, I was fractured yes. at that moment, don't mm -hmm. judge the 30 years, understand yeah. that I've just now realized 
that I've never gone back to the place before it's happened. I've learned to cope with this disability, this handicap, this missing yeah. puzzle piece. I've begun mm -hmm. to understand is that's not a whole me. I've been able to yeah. figure out the picture with maybe two or three pieces missing, but I mm -hmm. want an opportunity to see what life would look like if I could put those two or three pieces back yeah. in place. Yeah, because I've been resurrected from the dead. And I love, I love the one of the stories I love telling is the story of Lazarus. That even though the stone was removed, Jesus told the community to unbound the man, to remove the, 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 the bandages from him. It, he told the community to do it because if this man was going to come back to life, the community had to get hands on and they had to do the work. And so if we want people to heal and we want our world to heal, and you know, here's the thing about you know, abuse. If you abuse uh, anything, you'll abuse everything. You'll see it with animal abuse. You see it with uh, we're abusing our oceans and our society and our culture and the world. And because we have abused the one of the most precious, precious treasures we have, and that is our children, and so uh, and our people. So as a result, the world is responding to our abuse. And so if we're going to heal our world, we have to start by educating ourselves on the effects of abuse and trauma. And we have to start, start with, 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 um, with communities. And, and, and it's, I tell people this a lot, you know, in some states, to adopt a dog, you have to take training classes. You have to, <laughs> you know, people have to come to your house to make sure your house is conducive for the dog to live in. But you can have a baby and walk straight out the hospital without any training on how to. I, I always, uh, I always laugh because as a foster yeah. parent and now adoptive parent, we have to like go yeah. through like a couple hundred hours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we yeah. have people like checking up on us in the middle of the night. Yeah, if we yeah. Get the house clean. Exactly. And I was like, yeah. my my siblings, my cousins, they just had yeah. to have a drink and a good looking lady. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Like, so it is not, it's, it is not equal. It, yeah. So definitely. So, I'm like, I have like a million questions. I apologize. Yeah. I'm get, you yeah, and I are going to be chatting a lot. Um, oh, definitely, definitely. So I'm so because of this conversation, because of what you brought, my mm -hmm. awareness of what I don't know is raised, which is where really growth begins. It's like I didn't know mm -hmm. what I didn't know. Now I yes. know what I don't know, and mm -hmm. so that's the beginning of becoming better. Is recognizing oh, what you don't know. Yeah either through one of your books or through a resource that you really value, where do I like, okay, I may be a school bus driver, I may be a Sunday school teacher, I may be just a parent in a community. Mm -hmm. How do I raise my awareness and sensitivity into this topic so that I'm one of those people mm -hmm. that not only sees it, but hears yeah. it? Exactly. There's organizations like when I, uh, I love Darkness to Light. There are organizations that exist out there that you can go online. The information is free, um, uh, and, and they teach you about the effects of trauma. There are classes you can take. Uh, and so I, I tell people, you know, I'm still learning. Uh, and the more I learn, the more I'm able to recognize things in myself that I didn't know uh, trauma was still having an effect and a hold on me. So in order to become free from it, I had to understand that, you know, I wasn't a bad person. Something bad happened to me. And by knowing that, that alone freed me. And sometimes that's all victims want to know is that, you know, uh, you know, I need somebody to hear me and don't judge me because, you know, when you can hear the pain that I'm experiencing, you know, don't tell me not to drink. Ask me why do I drink? You know, don't tell me, you know, don't be, you know, and I know this, this is, this is very controversial, you know, don't tell me not to be permissive when you don't understand what sex means to me and how sex was introduced to me. Because a lot of times, you know, we tell people don't do things without understanding how they came to do them. And as a result of that, we do more harm than good. And so I have to tell people, you know, listen rather than judge. If a person is doing something, give them an opportunity to tell you why they do it, you know, what it means to them rather than judge them. And so we live in a society and a culture, we punish victims, unfortunately, we punish them. And, and, and victims pay attention to that. They, I pay attention to, you know, what they said about R. Kelly's victims. You know, that's a victim somewhere right now looking at how we treat, you know, our victims and they're saying, you know what, on second thought, maybe I won't come forward. If they don't believe them, I know they're not gonna believe me. You know, we, and we have to stop getting credence to people just because they hold power in positions. Uh, you know, so, um, we have to be very, very, and we have to become victim-centered versus 
trying worrying so much about doing harm to suspects we have to ask ourselves you know what is the cost or what is it costing us if we're trying to say okay we're going to protect the suspect to make sure they're not falsely accused versus let's listen to the victims and do all we can to make sure that, that victims feel not only validated but just justified in coming forth and having the courage to come forth to tell their story and and i i mean i could i can see so many lessons in it but i think it's interesting because one of the things i've become more aware of um with my son is we'll be listening to music and he's now in that 12 mm -hmm. year old I'm sorry, yeah. God, he's not 12, please, Lord, no. Um, <laughs> he's in the 10 year old age where uh, he'll be listening to music and he's like, I like this song. And I'm like, I don't like this song because yeah, it uses yeah. this phrase or talks yeah. about this or has this. And mm -hmm. I have to like tell him why that song might have a great yeah. rhythm, might have a great sound, but it's yeah. not the great right message. Yeah. So as parents, we have to start educating that we mm -hmm. can't continue to lift up artists no yeah. no disrespect it's, like r kelly yeah. yeah and say their music is great their behavior is bad because it's like well yeah. but he's got all of this and so nobody's holding and so we've got to be sensitive yeah. to the influences we're allowing to seep in quietly yeah but then i and, love when you told me the eyes are a great judge but a poor listener yeah that idea that <laughs> when i see a behavior so often i assume the behavior is the person and mm -hmm. I need to stop. And if I'm mm -hmm. especially around, well, around anybody, but maybe yeah. more sensitive to kids is what is that behavior? What is, what is not being heard that this behavior yeah. is amplifying? Yeah, because the brain controls behavior. And if trauma affects the brain, then trauma is going to affect behavior. And so a lot of times because the brain is fragmented and disconnected from the cognitive part of the brain, a lot of times people behave without even understanding uh, or having a knowledge of what they're doing. And, and, and that doesn't take away the responsibility or accountability for what they do, but help them understand that, hey, when a child responds, the part of the brain that's responsible for that behavior is because the child has learned or the person has learned to live with their survival brain and not their social brain. Because if you think about it, your social brain is the part of the brain. I tell people it's like the brakes, your, your prefrontal cortex is like the brakes of your brain. Your limbic system, the amygdala is like the gas, right? So if these two are connected and working in perfect order and, and they're healthy, you know, the cognitive brain can say, hey, that's not a good idea to do that because we want to belong to a group and we want to be sociable and we want to give everybody just do and be fair to everybody. So though that's a healthy brain. And so, but, but the person who's been traumatized, that part of the brain doesn't work effectively because of developmental trauma, it prevents the cognitive, uh, the prefrontal cortex from connected to the, to the, to the, to the survival brain and say, hey, pump the brakes, pump the brakes, right? So if those, if you don't have brakes and you're just driving a car with gas, you can't stop. You just fall and speed ahead. What I really love about our discussion today was so often we think of abuse and trauma as, mm. as a heart thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so everybody's like, heal the heart, heal your feelings, get, you know, like connect mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. And Ignore your past. Yeah. There's a whole big distance between this this biological gray space yep. yep that hasn't been shifted back oh yeah it hasn't been because, pulled back into alignment because it is still in the survival versus the social the cognitive versus yeah the, and so we try and address the feeling 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 and that's yeah. it okay trauma mm -hmm. though it may not be physical actually has a head injury element to it oh yeah Mental illness, and so that's how yeah, I find well. mental illness. It's it's, it's uh, it's, so we it's, never it's the, sort of think yeah. of abuse and that whole mental illness. Oh, that yeah, we have to, like yeah. your brain, it's like your computer and your video has screen, a virus. The yeah. cord is disconnected, you don't just sit there and, and yeah. that, you know, look at the hard drive yeah. going, Oh, come on, hard drive, you yeah, have yeah. to realize Cause... that the connections are broken, exactly. Because imagine putting a virus into a computer, what happens to the computer? It doesn't function properly. All right. It starts shutting down, start doing all kinds of weird stuff. And you're looking at your computer like, what's wrong with this thing? Well, it has a virus. Same thing with the brain. Trauma is a virus to the brain. And so oftentimes, you know, what happens is, is that we want the, we want the computer to work uh, with the virus, but we can't get proper functionality until we get rid of the virus. And to get rid of the virus, you have to understand how the virus got in and what type of virus you have. 
And so same thing with the brain. You, you can't just tell people to stop doing things. You know, it, 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 it irks me when I hear leaders tell people, forget about their past. Nothing irks me more than that because oh. <laughs> you, you can't, the brain was not made to forget. The brain was created to remember. So you can't, if I forgot that walking in front of a bus was dangerous, you know, I'd get killed. <laughs> you know? So, so it, it, to tell somebody to forget about their past is, 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 is dangerous because what you're telling them is their past don't matter and what happened to them in their past doesn't matter just to get over it. And that's I, the message that most people send, get over it. I love that. And now I'm, you just made it perfect for stupid people like me. <laughs> yes. I yeah. Like I'm like, whew, safe to the end, Derek. Yeah, yeah. It's been the story of my life. Yes, I sir. love this idea that trauma is a virus. Yeah. That has impacted yeah. the, the computer, so to speak. And mm -hmm. we can't just control alt delete and think it's nope. going to reset. We can't yeah, we just can't. say, get over it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, move away from the victim, lock up mm -hmm. dad, lock up the uncle, yeah. lock up the mom, mm -hmm. lock up the football coach, control off the league, get over it. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're going to visit that same website. You're going to visit, you're going to reboot mm -hmm. and all yep. of the things that brought that virus into existence are still yeah. going to be attacking and secretly corrupting. And it. see, this is where my yeah. brain works and, better. And that's, yeah. And I that's why, I, you know, false parents. I yeah. think of Y2K awesome. or back in yeah. the day when we had that 2000, what's going to happen to all the computers in the world in yeah. the year 2000, because mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years ago, we didn't program them to be able mm -hmm. to manage Y2K. It's yeah. the same with trauma. It's you had trauma at 12, but we didn't program you how to manage that first night of intimacy with your spouse. That. Yep. We did. That when yep. your child turns 12 and you see them the way you looked when mm -hmm. you were victimized, how mm -hmm. that can be your Y2K moment and that virus mm -hmm. can suddenly reemerge in your life and begin to yeah. cause you to shut down and yeah. re-experience and change the behavior. You made yeah. it so simple for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. You got yeah, because oh, it. I got it. Because <laughs> cause, cause sometimes... Oh, false. sorry. I, I didn't feel weird because I was like, man, I am not... I'm trying yeah. to. I'm trying to see it the way that I can now. For me, I have to see it. That, like now, I so see how yeah. that virus may not impact my Word document, but it might impact my Adobe yeah. Acrobat. Exactly. And so, as a foster you, parent, you can take a child out of an abusive environment and take them into and put them in a, a nice environment, and they'll still exhibit the same behaviors. And then sometimes, when I do foster parent training. They said, well, I gave them everything. They got a house, they got food. They, they, I'm not abusing them. They live in a, but the virus is still there. And so the behavior comes with the package, the child. So even though you shift environments, the behavior and the trauma comes with the person. Yeah, you and you may leave. not open yeah. that app, so to speak, for two or three yeah. years, but the minute yeah. you do, the, the virus is it. there. That's it. And, and that's all why it takes we have needs to honor door. that idea of the Me mm -hmm. Too movement when women oh, yeah. and men are coming yeah. forward 15, 20, 30 years later, it's like, finally, when I heard somebody speak or I connected that story, it rang back to that virus that's been sitting inside mm -hmm. of me. And now I've been mm -hmm. able to figure it. And now I'm coming to sort of the software solution. Yeah. I don't need that justice courtroom. I need to get rid of that virus. I need to be restored mm -hmm. to the factory yeah. default settings that God exactly. created me into. Exactly. And we need to start holding people who commit abuse offenses responsible for the restoration process by charging them, making them responsible for, for the therapy that victims, because victims need therapy. They need, they need, they need the actual uh, help that they need, and they don't need to have, to have to be the ones who pay for the damage that was done upon them. We need to hold the people who are responsible for the trauma to be the ones who pay for the healing of the victims. Yeah, and, because, uh, I mean, in every other case, I have an insurance provider, I have FEMA. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have some outside agency that will come back and say, you know, yeah. your, your home was hit by a storm. We've got yeah. these emergency funds. We'll restore you to pre-storm damage. Yeah. But we don't mm -hmm. have a way for a victim to say, I really need to be talking to somebody and I can't yeah. afford it and my insurance won't cover it or I'm yeah. not insurable because mm -hmm. I can't maintain a job because every time I get in a situation where a boss is leaning over me at a desk, yep. I have a... So yep. it's, it's the layering, it's, the effect and the impact. Yeah, yeah that's true. Dude, and it, it has a long be, time I, effect. I, I, feel, I feel small <laughs> next to you. I feel like, <laughs> I mean, oh, like, man, I don't say that. Like, <laughs> and just don't be happy, take it. Oh, 
Man, dude. But, but yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. You are you That's are amazing. Oh, thank you, you know, so much. Your, I appreciate your that. knowledge, your compassion, your empathy, your commitment to to healing children and adults. Yes. And your awareness of the trauma and abuse that just the perspective shift yes and it's and it's i mean the perspective shift mm -hmm. as a mental illness that needs to be seen for what it is and the behavior yeah. i mean for now we have to be intentional I can, and i can guarantee you that anybody that brings you into a conference into a speaking engagement into a school a church a police station a healthcare right. system will walk right. away just wanting you to come back every day because I appreciate you that, layer yeah. and layer and you mm -hmm. you haven't you see the echo yeah. and you're trying to race to the edge of the shores to meet yeah. it where it can be and yeah you're phenomenal Our future. thank you sir our future depends on it if we don't if we don't address this now we we're going to have a, a a storm of 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 of, of mass proportions coming because you know already we've been affected by unresolved trauma and I, I mean yeah i mean think of it if we are willing to abuse the most innocent thing mm -hmm. where do we yeah. stop you, and, and that's the thing and and we, we and we, we don't understand the interconnectedness of it all that abuse not only affects a person it affects us it's it's robbing us of the potential and, and the, the possibilities. It's that, that desensitization, you know, yeah. like if we're like, yeah. oh, but you got to understand, like not, and yeah. I don't want to pick on R. Kelly, don't hear it. It's just a visual yeah. that we can all, if we start mm -hmm. to dismiss that behavior, mm -hmm. then the baseline yeah. has just been moved up. Yeah. And yeah. the next person, like, yeah. And it just keeps being like, well, when is bad enough too bad? Yeah. Because you got Larry Nasser, you got Jerry Sandusky, you have Epstein, you have all these people that we keep responding, oh, that was horrible, then two years later it happens again. It's because we never dealt with the problem, right? We responded to an issue, but we never dealt with the undercurrent, the problem, which is abuse, and how abuse destroys, not just, not just the person, it destroys our culture. Uh, and so if we don't get educated on the effects of abuse and trauma, I think we left. I'll give you a minute to bounce back in case you're hearing me. Um, I got to thank everybody. Uh, I see Kevin's locked in. I know we were having some issues before, so um, I'll just stand by and chatter for a minute. Uh, if it, somebody can give me a thumbs up that they can hear me, and it's only Kevin locked, that would help. Um, you guys, the layering and the layering brought, man, that is huge. I know that I'm going to be going back and digging and digging and digging into my own awareness, my own understanding, my own thoughts. Thanks, Greg. I mean, this idea that when we're willing to overlook the smallest abuse, we set ourselves up to overlooking the biggest. That idea that we are a community to unbind our community. That I mean, Kevin just brought it. Kevin, I'm sorry. I'm just... I, I've been preparing all week. I've been setting up for all week. I've been studying all week, but I didn't expect it to be this big. And when it goes this big, this clear, this loud, I believe it's for a purpose bigger than just our fun friend Friday and the few of us that were gathered here today. I believe this is one of those messages that it's an obligation for us to find as many ways to channel it and share it and broadcast it because somebody else is sitting in a seat much like Kevin was when when he wanted to come forward and speak, and he doesn't need to feel like a victim. It's that restorative justice piece. I mean, that that to me is big, that understanding of it. It's like a computer virus that we don't know when it's going to emerge again, and we don't know if they're going to be in a place where there's going to be somebody that can manage it for them. We've got to stop looking at it as you have to prove your innocence. Instead, ask, what is it we need to do to bring you back to a place before you felt this, before you experienced this, before you were broken in this? Um, man, that one is big. Um, I'm trying, like, there are so many nuggets that my brain is just <laughs> overloaded. And I say that in a really great way because I learned, I grew, I got so much out of it today. 
that that idea of the social brain versus the survival and cognitive brain and how they were separated in that moment and it wouldn't be unusual for a victim not to be able to tell the entire story because that wasn't what they were focused on. They were focused on surviving, not recording social cues. That idea that when the eyes are great judges but poor listeners. I could go on all day. Um, so let me see if I can bring them back for a close. And if not, then we will be good. Um, Kevin, if you can hear me, just ask to be invited back into the room or just say hello real quick. Ah, there you are. Um, let me see if I can do it this way. Ah. Let me try one more trick, you guys, sorry. I know you're all getting to see my big fat thumb. Um, where is that, where is that? Anyhow, I'm sorry, Kevin, there we go. Uh, it's. Yeah, um, Kevin, I can't pull you back in because the technology says you're still connected. So you'd have to shut all the way down and come all the way back up. Um, let me try one other trick. No, nope. sorry. Um, so Kevin, I know I took up more of your holiday time than we had planned. I appreciate you and thank you for being part of today. Um, it seems like something's going on with your camera or your connection. So I thank you. We will make sure to, ah, there he is. Maybe I can get him this way. There we go. Give me just a second, everybody. I didn't want to jump up and leave the dinner party without saying thank you to our host, Kevin, um, or our special guest or whatever it is. He should be out of here just a minute. There you go. I apologize. Hey. I felt like we just ate rags. You know, <laughs> no, that's cool. With the the bag <laughs> you know, I appreciate it. Um, I was just telling everybody, I've got like 20 like nuggets that I have got to steal and write out. What I will do is I will make sure this gets up onto the YouTube, over to the um, Your Life um, series as well. Kevin, I'm going to transcribe it and send it to you so that if somebody has particular questions or thoughts from it, you'll know where it occurred during the conversation. And anything you want us to know as we walk out of the room, I would just say, you know, I think we're in a great time. I think we're in a great time where we're being um, we're being challenged to to become better listeners, to to better to 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 become more of a community of people who care and are concerned about what happens to not just one of us but all of us. And that the more we can educate ourselves and learn about trauma and abuse, the more we can get out in front of it and prevent it and not just respond to it. And so my greatest hope and greatest prayer is that someone got something out of this conversation that can kind of spark something in them to say, you know what, you know, maybe I need to get involved more than just waiting for something to happen or to some, someone else to do the work. Maybe I've been called to do something, as, uh, even if it's just donate money to organizations that's doing the work already. So it's been a pleasure. I'm so well, grateful as always. No, I am thankful to you. I am not of the divine order that I have the official authority to decree and declare, but I will <laughs> tell you, I think your prayer was answered. I think, yes. I know I got something out of it. I know that oh, I'm going to stop judging behaviors and start listening. I know yes, sir, that I have, my perspective has been like, is my friend, Dr. Tanya Lowe, who's also in Lawrenceville, the okay, riot cool. starter would say, you have yeah. started a riot in my thinking. And so, thank you, um, sir. I just, I, as a, as a, a shared person of faith, um, I just, so, I really pray that you, the opportunities that you seek to impact the world, so. come to you abundantly. Thank you. Um, that without, without restrictions and without barriers, because one voice heard can change yes. the world. That's it. Yeah. And yeah. I want yeah. nothing to prevent you from being the person that guides that voice into being heard. Well, thank you, Eric. That means so much to me. You've made my day. Uh, I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to share this. And I think it was a divine connection. Uh, I, nothing I, happens by. I, yeah. I, I always worry about those because I'm like, I, you know, I say yeah. we're worthy, but I always worry about the responsibility yeah. about those. Oh, yeah. But it's I hope divine I handled it well. Again, everybody you did. connect with Kevin. He is a resource yes. that you need to have in your portfolio. 
and yes. ready on your speed dial because you never know when somebody's going to step up and you're going to say, look, I, I, I don't know how to best manage this, but if you'll give me time, I will go to my go-to guy, which is yeah. always going to be Kevin. And then yeah. talk and to I'll... your organizations. Talk to, I mean, if you work in corporate America that makes widgets, this may not sound like something that you need to know, but there are people in the cubicle next to you that would love to have yeah. a conversation like this in their workplace mm -hmm. so that they yeah. could breathe easier. So don't dismiss oh, yeah. that it's only kids or only kids in trauma or mm -hmm. only, you know, women in abuse shelters. Yeah. There is trauma hiding everywhere. Everywhere, yes. And it's preventing people's potential and performance from being the best that they can be. And so uh, just like that computer and that virus, you know, we were created to be wonderful, to be great, to be, to be in community. And trauma isolates us, and it makes us feel lonely, even when we're around people. So um, I, I would say, you know, definitely uh, it affects everything, work, play, you know, relationships especially, in particular family. So, yes. And I got to thank you for that computer work because I am just feeling good. Yeah, thank I'm you. Like, I can see it. I can see it all now. Yeah, I appreciate I, I, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that one. Because, and you can oh, do that you. one as well as <laughs> stepping out of the uniform and into me. Um, oh, yeah. I like that. I can't that. wait to I like that. that book. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'm going to put it together, sure enough. So. All right. I, I mentioned you in the credits. Uh, I, I, I've gotten less than the past, so I'm okay. I got you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, my sir. I appreciate it. Drive safely. Thank you. When you get back to Atlanta, thank you. we're going to be doing lunch, I'm sure. Till then. Thank you, sir. Thank you again. Be safe. All right. And uh, thank you, I appreciate Eric. everybody. Everybody else, I will see you on Monday morning on Success Life Live at 8 a.m. Till then, go out, live your life with success because truthfully, you are worthy. It may, yes. somebody may have shattered that belief when you were 10 or 12, but that, that, that gift of worthiness was given to you before trauma happened. Mm -hmm. And though we yes. cannot restore you back to that place right here and right now, I want you to know that you are worthy before, you were worthy before that event and you are worthy after that yeah. event. Mm -hmm. And never let that go. All right, everybody, I'll yes. see you on Monday. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you again, sir. I know from thank you